Ladies and gentlemen, let us now continue to the fourth keynote lecture entitled Using Design-Based Research to Promote Interdisciplinary Secondary Mathematics and Science Teaching Through Real Tasks Across National Study in Australia and Indonesia. Our fourth keynote speaker is Dr. Wanti Widaya from Tikkin University, Australia whose presentation will be chaired by Ibu Veronica Tribrihatini. Please give a warm welcome to Code of Home. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished speakers. Um, this is my honor to be a moderator for Dr. Wan Vijaya. Before we start her presentation, I would like to read her curriculum vitae. Uh, well, <laughs> Dr. Wan Vijaya uh, earned her bachelor degree in mathematics education from Sanata Dharma University, and then she pursued her master in education in mathematics education in Boston University, and uh, continuing her PhD at the University of Melbourne, Australia, in 2008, and in 2013 she got a graduate certificate of higher education from Deakin University, Australia. She is at present um, a course director of the Bachelor of Education Primary at Deakin University. And congratulations, Wandi, you are a senior lecturer in mathematics education. So, um, without further ado, I would uh, ask the time to Ibu Wanti to have a presentation for about 30 to 40 minutes and after that we come to the question and answer sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Budri, for your kind introduction. Selamat pagi, Bapak Ibu. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> okay, uh, we're fine, let's see. So I'll try to stand if I can. Uh, maybe I can walk around a little bit, but I'm a bit nervous about this. <laughs> I'll stay here for a moment, but I might come a little bit closer later on. So thank you for coming today. Thank you for coming today. So today I will be sharing a research, a joint research project actually, with uh, the team from Senator Dharma University, with Pak Hongki, Pak Sarkim, and Pak Lulu. So we've done this for two years. Is that correct, Pahongki? So we started with a pilot project funded by Deakin and USD, and then we, uh, Pasarkim and his team, Pahongki and Palulu, managed to uh, secure or win the Dikti funding. So we continue last year with the money from Dikti. So I'll be reporting from this particular project about uh, basically the use of design-based research in our uh, research project. So the project actually started with this rationale and um, you might be aware that there, I don't know, in Indonesia as well, I think in the past few years, there is a strong emphasis to actually focus on more interdisciplinary approaches in teaching STEM. So, but I believe that's quite new, isn't it, Bangi? Um, in Australia, it has been you know, going on for some time, but still I think we have issues about, you know, how the, um, to think about the best way to actually facilitate the interdisciplinary teaching um, and increasing teacher capacity for teaching STEM and, and you know, eventually I think in improving or uh, enhancing secondary student scientific uh, mathematics and mathematics literacy. So those are the rationale behind this project um, and I would like to bring your attention to this new actually just coming up Russell just sent it a few days ago so you might know Professor Russell Tadler from Deakin University so he's the um, chair of the STEM uh, education at our university and he's a superstar so he was being interviewed by this um, TV program to talk about why we do need to focus on uh, STEM. And, and he was talking about a report that he wrote for Ford Foundation about 100 jobs in the future. And that's one of the driver for um, you know, interdisciplinary STEM is the economic uh, 
drive that you know in the future you actually you like you know routine jobs will be gone and replaced by robots so you need to put, uh, teach students differently and focus on different skills so I'll just play this video to begin with uh, and then Here's a question. Have you ever considered becoming a cyborg psychologist, haven't we all? Uh, what about a nanomedical engineer or a autonomous vehicle designer? Uh, these all sound like bizarre jobs. Not exactly your traditional bricky or banker, but according to a joint report that's out today by Deakin and Griffith Universities as well as Ford, they are just a few of the future careers that are set to become a reality in the space of the next decade. Now, here to explain this is Professor of Science Education Russell Tartler from Deakin University. Good morning to you. Uh, just how dramatically is the workforce set to change in the coming years? Well, it's changed already, Tom. I mean, kids are, are getting into uh, more technical jobs, they're having more jobs uh, in a lifetime than we've had. Uh, uh, and uh, I think with the change of technology automation, the jobs are going to change with lots of opportunities, uh, as our report found. In, in what sort of way exactly will we be seeing jobs transform? I saw a lot of robotics work uh, will be involved in all of this. Yes, I think a lot of the jobs and what's driving the jobs is technology. Yeah, and we're finding that already in terms of social media and the way we use um, machines. A lot of routine jobs are going to disappear. That's been some time. But what we found in the uh, job study that we did was that uh, there will be a lot of jobs looking at the machine people interface, there will be lots of jobs requiring uh, creative problem solving as routine jobs and as routine aspects of jobs change. So will the school level require to go up, the jobs will become potentially more interesting. A lot of these jobs that we're uh, looking at in the report don't even exist yet. How, how do you prepare kids in terms of an education when you don't know what the jobs are at the end of the road? Well, this was the question that we, uh, we really started with. Uh, and we, we've got this uh, future jobs quiz that we've designed uh, at 100jobsofthefuture.com where we take uh, youth or general public through uh, re really a, a questioning of their interests and future directions and, and we throw up jobs of the future that might interest them and we give them an idea of the skills that will be required and where they can go to get them more information. So we've discussed the jobs that you see as uh, the way of the future. What are the jobs you actually expect to be almost phased out in, in the coming years? Well, I think uh, already we're getting uh, routine jobs phased out where the, these um, tasks can be done by machines. But as much as that, I think what will happen, and it's important to remember, a lot of the jobs we have currently will say that they'll change dramatically in, um, in nature. So for instance, your psychol psychologist that you talked about, um, increasingly, uh, in order to improve our lives, we'll have machine implants of various sorts, and that will become more out there as time goes on. And so that will raise questions that um, people will need to deal with about their identity and how to uh, exist alongside these machines that become part of them. So, so uh, psychologists um, now uh, aren't called upon to do this so much, but in the future we expect they'll, they'll be every job's more like this. What do you think robots will take over the world? Uh, this is an interesting question. What we found was when we talked about uh, talk to our experts, it is that it's not so much a matter of fighting or competing with machines. It'll be a matter of working alongside them and using them to our advantage. And that's where people skills are going to be increasingly important um, for uh, you know, dealing with how people interface with machines and dealing with how to design machines to, um, to support us. Just quickly, that's an interesting point you make there because if we direct everyone towards uh, working in, in science and, and working with robotics and these kind of things, to have people skills will almost become a unique talent uh, in some respect, won't it? I think, um, and this is what interests uh, me and, uh, and my colleagues as educators, uh, that we need to think about our education and if we're going to be talking about STEM schools, which we certainly are, it's going to be alongside problem solving, creativity and people skills. Teamwork, uh, that's clearly uh, signalled in a lot of reports that are coming out. So it's not being, coming just technical, it's 
combining the technical with the, uh, the people skills and the problem solving. And Arnold, very interesting stuff. Professor, we uh, appreciate your time on the show this morning. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so that's what uh, coming up from the report, the recent report, the fact that actually it's very important that in our education we focus on the soft skills like problem solving, reasoning, uh, communication into the future. Um, it's not just teaching students routine skills like, you know, just doing the um, addition like uh, or the algorithm by memorizing, that's not going to help them to find jobs um, in the future. So I think that's a really interesting uh, point. What we find uh, when we did the literature review to start this project, we identified some of the gaps in the current literature and um, one of the issues with the STEM interdisciplinary research, often you know the different researchers define the, the terminology differently and it has been quite inconclusive in terms of what effective, if you're talking about STEM integration, what effective STEM integration entails. Um, different interpretation of STEM inter integration, um, different nature and the role of, you know, such and scope of such integration. There are different, you know, uh, level of integration, hopefully, obviously. And the last point is about the lack of balance um, and transparent content representation in STEM. Um, as a math educator, I find like often when people are doing STEM research or call it a STEM project, often the presence of mathematics is quite minimal. Or you know the uh, the team is actually consists of mostly science people or engineers. So we do want to make the and the mathematics in STEM a little bit more prominent. Um, sorry about that. Okay. And we also realize there are key barriers to integration of interdisciplinary approaches as well uh, between science and mathematics. One of them is because I think science and mathematics do have a different tradition, like in the, they do have different traditions and different pedagogical approaches perhaps as well. Um, and one of the key challenges when we try to work with teachers in, in classrooms is the fact that in schools, and this is true in both Australia and Indonesia, we still have um, like silos timetable, like you know, maths is scheduled on timetable separately than science. And it's very difficult for the two teachers from the two subject areas actually to, you know, plan together because they're focusing on you know, covering the curriculum for their own discipline. So that is the issue, a uh, practical issue, but that's an important one when we're talking about making changes in, in practice. Okay. Um, in terms of theoretical perspective or underpinning for this project, um, from mathematics, we are looking at the literature from problem solving, mathematical modeling, um, which I think is very relevant for this particular context. Um, we work closely with the science team, the science educators at Deakin and I think at Sanada Dharma as well because the team was comprised of both maths and science. Um, so in science education, especially the, the researchers at Deakin has been like looking at the use of multimodal representations and they even come up with this call, um, an approach called representation construction approach. So Russell and Peter Haber was kind of like leading that uh, um, theoretical framework. Uh, so that's the theoretical underpinning for the project. Uh, we start this project because of the commonalities, but we also realize that there will be differences between the two countries. Uh, obviously, contacts play a different role and um, like you know the history and the policy in um, different countries so that is what we uh, try to explore um, in this project we agreed to use the real world context and tasks i know we had a discussion i had a discussion with martin about the use of term maybe you have to rethink about that um, use the multiple theoretical frameworks and the multi-tiered design research approach and um, the contemporary video capture using the GoPro and stuff like that, and the swivel. Just yeah. quickly to revisit the conception of or the sort of like the 
the meeting of design research in education. And I know because this is our third day, everyone is very familiar with design research. So I'll just quickly go through. Basically, we chose this uh, methodological approach because design research really address the problem of uh, engineering particular approaches in, in terms of addressing um, the problem, the problem in the classroom maybe, and here we through iterative cycles of you know, how the learning takes place and reflecting on that. Um, I like this particular quote because I think it talks about working together also with uh, practitioners, so design research always um, they put an emphasis on working researchers working together with practitioners to address the problem and inform the future practice. Um, Reeves come up with this sort of like framework to talk about the process of design research. It doesn't look cyclical to me, but I guess it sort of like shows the steps, but uh, a little bit more. But you kind of miss the cycles, I think, <laughs> uh, the cyclical features. So uh, for our project, we kind of like combine the theoretical framework by Vasquez, who proposed um, this one. So Vasquez came up with this model about um, different levels of integration um, in STEM. So um, Sierra colleagues talk about you know that in fact there are varying levels of spectrum of integration. In some schools, maybe you started with disciplinary approach, and then you move on to more multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and transdisciplinary. So it doesn't have to have one form of um, sort of like levels of integration. It can be along the spectrum and move up. Um, you might have seen some of these slides before, uh, so I'm just sharing because we ran this project over two years. So the first cycle. We have two schools, um, and this is com uh, completed in one of the schools. So they started with the context, the real world context of uh, the teacher is having a problem because she or he had a leaking tap, and the students are supposed to help to work out, you know, how much is that going to cost the teacher because the water bill is going to be very expensive if you have a leaking tap. So can you work out? Uh, that issue. So they work in small groups to address the problem and they have to brainstorm and then they come up with this plan, like you know, just brainstorming ideas about the plan. How do, can they, uh, how will they collect the data? So like here, like using the tab in, in the lab or in the school and then how would they work out the rates per drop and per <laughs> on water usage and work out the solution to that. So that can be a very simple task that can be completed in one or two lessons even. So it doesn't have to be like the same task, it doesn't have to be like taking the whole trimester, but it can be as well. So but if you work with teachers who are quite new, it might be too daunting to start with something that is too big. So you might want to start with something small, but it still has the same um, interdisciplinary approach and get students to you know, engage in inquiry approaches into their learning. So as you can see, students are collecting data, they're using digital uh, phone, uh, phone and uh, um, other digital tools. So when we design um, the, uh, the project and the activity, these are the questions that probably come up uh, that we have to think about, like, you know, in terms of the support uh, for students, but also for the teachers, how would they assess students' learning? Uh, through the process. And the teachers are very good. So in this particular school, because they they already have a sort of like have started to attend what is called a STEM center. So uh, every two weeks they have what um, in their timetable, they call it a STEM challenge week. So um, that's where the science teacher and the math teachers come together. So they don't have separate maths and science teacher. It's called a STEM challenge week or some challenge class. So I think that is very, uh, a very interesting way to actually get the, um, get the interdisciplinary approaches um, started in school. If you, the school can actually allocate um, in that timetable separately. 
So for the follow-up class, that was the first class, the water bill, and the second class is about a project that they completed over, I think, four lessons. And it's a challenge, it's a challenge, and they do it for every single school, uh, year seven school, and the, the, it's like a competition, like a challenge. So there will be a winner, and then, you know, there's a, like uh, only one group as a representative of each of the classes, uh, each class. So the design problem is there, they have to design an advertisement, so technology comes into play. Um, they have to write the design brief and they have to convince um, the others that you know they are producing um, the most efficient or the most sophisticated, so sophisticated water purification system. And so they have to actually test it on the day um, and then there is a measurement for, uh, and the judges will actually decide who are the winner for that, um, three winners for this challenge. Okay. Um, so, teachers' experiences and few. So the teachers talk about ch some challenges like finding the uh, common touch points in the curriculum. So it's not always very easy. So that's the first step actually when we decided them. We look at the curriculum map or the curriculum um, goals and then try to find where can we find a real world context that would address mathematics as well as Science, because you know teachers have to address those those things in their teaching and teach the content as well. So that's not too easy when, um, especially when the students are actually having a VCE exam, for instance. Um, but also, I think the thing uh, that they talk about is the challenge gets students to think about not only science and mathematics, but also some like social justice or social uh, economic sort of like issues. So, you know, when they're buying a uh, bottle of water that they realize actually after they did the task that it's too expensive actually to buy a bottle of water. And you know, you talk about the environmental impact of using plastics and things like that. So that comes into the discussion as well. So I'll report about the, the following years, uh, the following cycle. So only one school participate, uh, continue with the cycle, but the teachers are different than the first cycle actually. So um, what is good about the second cycle, I think the, the key improvement in the second cycle is actually the two teachers work in team teaching kind of like uh, set up. So you know, they are working together in teaching the science and the math lesson. And with the challenge, they actually continue to, to work on the same task in both maths and science lesson. So the integration is a little bit more uh, than, I think, the first cycle. Um, the, the, in terms of coming up with the task, it was designed together with the teachers. So, you know, as we expected in design research, um, interdisciplinary in nature and authentic um, using the real world context. Um, so in this particular one that I'm going to share, we started with a very simple activity like getting, revisiting the, the, the topics that they have learned about energy and different types of energy and energy transfer by using toys like, you know, like bouncing balls and different sets of toys. So that's the first lesson. And then, you start, uh, then the next lesson um, introduced the use of um, not the use of, but introduce the context of a uh, skateboard part. Uh, we use the app, like the uh, sort of like um, it's an app or a, 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 yeah an app in the science for the science lesson. So and then did the experiment in this uh, classroom over time and collecting data. And these are some of the prompts. Sorry if it's not very clear. It's a bit dark. But these are some of the questions that the teacher has in front to guide the discussion or the activity with students. And you can see that most of the questions are probably more science questions. Um, the mathematics, if you're wondering, what is the mathematics connection? So it's actually connected to the concept of percentages. One of the issues or one of the things that they have to work on in this context is that um, the, the second harm, I think, like the expectation is that the second harm has to be 105% from the previous one. How do you work or design your 
uh, marble line. So we started with that context and then we get the students to actually design the marble line project. It's called Marble Run Project. So this is one of the uh, transcript from the conversation between one of the group um, who showed the teacher to design and then the teacher asked ask this girl a uh, question that you told me about you know something about the energy transformation you're kind of interested in the degree of the energy trans transformation though it's great that you have identified some of the things but what about like the design has to be 105% higher than the previous time does your design fulfill that criteria so you know um, it's that's a start, but you know, the teacher is challenging the students about can you actually convince others that you have fulfilled the mathematics criteria and how do you work it up? And the student said, oh, I can try to work that up. Uh, these are some of the assessment criteria that put, we put forward. And uh, I think in Indonesian context, um, there's also a strong push to focus on the 21st um, century when I was in Singapore working there, I think that's also one of the key emphasis in their curriculum. So I think that's quite common in many countries. I don't know, Martin, in the Netherlands, probably also the same thing. Yeah, and in, in Japan maybe as well, I think. So that's quite a common thing. Um, so this is just to show you a curriculum mapping, and this is um, the rubric that the teachers created for students in terms in terms of um, you know assessing their learnings because you know the teachers came up with this one themselves so not us but the students have to assess their own learning so the ownership of the learning goes back to students so they have to tick uh, and identify you know from their experience and the learning experience where they are at in terms of this rubric and then can you show the evidence in their report so it's not just saying that, oh, I think I'm actually very good at, you know, um, I can, not just, I can calculate. So you can see that the students sometimes only identify not the very top skills, you know, so that's quite, quite good because it gets you to be some critical about your own learning, self-aware, I think. Again, this is the same thing about, um, but talking about the science concept, so, you know, in the rubric you have the mathematics and science. One of the comments from the teachers is the technology aspect of it, um, that we actually probably missed the opportunity to include that a little bit more strongly in the rubric. And we don't have the technology teacher involved in our project, and that's one of the reflections from the teachers that, you know, if you're doing it again next time, maybe it will be good to include the technology teachers and then work as a team together to um, improve that aspect of it. So we hear about motivation and persistence. I think that's a very important skill uh, when you're learning. Uh, uh, you know, I remember my when I did my PhD, they keep talking about our PhD is about 99% inspiration and 1% of what? <laughs> So you don't have to be super smart to do a PhD or to finish a PhD, but you have to be very, very persistent and work very hard I think, to get to the finish line. So, uh, and I think that's true. But, um, teachers and students via the experiences. So we want to hear uh, from the students themselves and I'll, get, uh, I'll play this video again. Hopefully everything's working. Come up with your design.
Um, it went good. I think we got like, we got creative and like got looked at different ways and how to like fix it and like do it. Um, well, I really liked STEM because like you could have an open mind and you could have like you could create different things that you wouldn't usually do in like science and stuff. And we got an opportunity to like create things to be more independent. I think it's good that we were like, able to use our creativity to make it, and we didn't have to follow any rules. Yeah. Okay, uh, so just to share with you some of the world order sketches that the students came up with uh, when they designed their marble run and you've seen their presentation. So what happened during the presentation, the teacher actually interviewed the groups and Peter and I were there and then we decided who won the challenge based on the presentation as well as the content. Uh, the maths and the science, uh, kind of like how they actually incorporate that or address that. So it was quite good because the students seem to enjoy it. I mean, that's a lot of work because um, they have to put up all those uh, marble run. And I think one of the, during the interview with students, they said like, the cleaner took them down and then we have to redo, like put them up again. And it was quite a, uh, a nuisance for them. Like, you know, so it's more like, you know, the hard work. But they talk about the importance of teamwork, like working in teams together and you know, collaborative learning and things like that. So all the soft skills that we address, I think, through that. So um, the potential of the real world, I won't read it for you, but this is what uh, the teachers said about the potential of the context. So it's not, it's familiar enough, that's important, I think, for students to be able to engage with the problem. Um, so it's not too out of their kind of like um, their own context because then some of them play skateboard or seen some people play skateboard. Um, the practical uh, practical activities that involves you know the use of fancy balls and things like that. That's a re to revisit the content that I've learned before is good. Um, so they, the students actually have to come up with a written report, not just coming up with the, pro, uh, the prototype, you can, you can call it a prototype, uh, and you know, um, so, and this is from the students, so they talk about what happened when it didn't work, um, we have to find ways to fix it, so you have to be quite creative when things didn't work, and you know, think on your feet, um, improve your success rate. Uh, and they talk about angle and start it again. So there's a lot of mathematics as well involved. And critical thinking, that's another thing that they come up with. Um, and the use of digital technology in these particular activities. Okay? Alright, so that's how they identify in the prototype where they kind of like address the issue of the expectation of reaching the 105 percent. That's it from me. Thank you so much for your attention. I'm looking forward to hear from uh, to hear your feedback and your questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Wendy. Let's give applause to uh, her presentation. Uh, now we will open the question and answer sessions. I will open the first round to three persons. First. Second. Okay, so can you mention your name and institution, please? Uh, I'm Wahi from Mombok. Uh, it's an honor to meet you, Wendy. Uh, I have read your all work, all, mostly of your works, but now I can see you by myself. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, in Indonesia, uh, we have thematic approach, although there is uh, last year uh, in thematic book erase the concept in the mathematics textbook. So now mathematics in primary school uh, has a, a standalone textbook, not in the form of a thematic approach. Uh, one of the issue of the approach is the proportionality of the content which involved in the mathematics and the other uh, subject, for example, social or uh, science. Uh, so in your research, is the that uh, is that uh, proportionality or balance balance between 
the content of science, technology, and mathematics uh, an issue for the teacher, or even in your research? Okay, thank you. Okay, one. Uh, yeah, we, we will be waiting for the second question. So. Okay, all right, thank you so much for your question. I don't think we've got the balance right from our project. I think it's still quite, I mean, this is coming from the interview data with uh, both the maths and the science teacher. Especially from the maths teacher, um, they still felt that the maths is taking a back seat. So um, I think we can improve it. If we get an opportunity to redo it again, maybe starting with the context that has a stronger mathematics uh, focus to begin with. Because I think it's it started with the science kind of like activity, so the science is a bit more prominent, and students can see that it's more physical, I guess. Like you know, so so I agree with your point that it's actually not easy to, and it's reported in a lot of projects as well that you know when you're doing a STEM project, it tends to be more science and to be more pr prominent. Um, the thematic approach, I think it's quite a that they dropped it. Um, I don't know whether they have actually data to support why that's not working. But like what Martin said yesterday, I think um, maybe that creates a bit more work for teachers and you know it's not working. I don't know. Like because I think when you introduce a new idea, it's actually you really need to, to provide a lot of professional development for teachers to be able to embrace that approach. And it takes a while. You know, it cannot be done even like one, two years, maybe more than that. Um, so yeah, people don't like to change, unfortunately. So they don't like to step outside their comfort zone. So it's, it's always difficult to introduce something. I remember a very wise man, Professor Lee Pei Yi, said like in Singapore, they only change the curriculum, like the big change in Singapore, and unfortunately, Tin Lam is not here. But they do it every 10 years because he said like, you know, teachers cannot keep up with too many frequent changes. So if you really want to make significant changes in curriculum and you want teachers to buy in and then, you know, really implement a new one, you actually have to give 10 years time. So, you know, to act, otherwise it won't work. So, so I think that's a very, very wise approach because otherwise we just keep changing things, but we don't have data to actually reflect on why we make changes and why it's not working and why yeah, because the next thing might not work as well. So I don't know, that is sort of like my reflection, but happy to hear from other people as well. Okay, thank you. Now the second question. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, STEM education uh, is. Excuse me, can you mention your name? My name is Rahman Johar from Unsia, Aceh. Uh, we know now uh, STEM education is um, a very. Um, I, I mean, STEM education is. Uh, every country need how to implement STEM in teaching and learning process, especially for mathematics teaching. Uh, we also try to design a small topic uh, to implement STEM education, but we still think about how to build, how to construct mathematics during STEM uh, process. For example, we design the problem about uh, create a map for a student house dream. How to say? Rumah idaman, how to say in the house, okay. <laughs> we asked students to design the dream house for their own, uh, for, uh, uh, for next year maybe. Uh, we still confused what mathematics concept we want to uh, construct, we want to student build. Uh, we, we analyze uh, special ability, we also want to um, develop the scale, scala, uh, but um, we we difficult to identify why and how to know the student understand or not about the scale because there are many activities there. We use 
AutoCAD software, we also use a Google SketchUp, uh, and difficult to us to know the student really know or not about the scale or special ability. So how to uh, focus for mathematics uh, through STEM education. Thank you, Burahma. Very good question. I think that's one of the challenges actually. And then in our design project, um, for this project, we like that. I think because Peter has a lot of experience in STEM science, especially. Uh, so we we reflected on our first cycle, the first year that. You, you know, we actually let the teachers design the whole rubric and we provided feedback about some of the missing things. Uh, and often the mathematics is missing. <laughs> and, you know, you have to kind of like get the teachers to make sure that that is included. Um, but I think one of the key things is to decide with teachers the assessment uh, and how they're going to assess the students' learning, like what you said. So it's not just about doing the activities or completing the project or the, uh, yeah. Um, that's why in this particular school we have like the written part, the, the report, as well as um, the presentation. So the presentation is about their communication skill, their creative and problem solving skill, um, you, you know, that sort of like teamwork skills and things like that. But if you want to find evidence of learning, you can look at the report and they actually have to uh, do the self-evaluation through the rubric. They have to do the self-assessment, and the teachers will mark them as well, mark the report. Uh, we also have pre- and post-tests, um, and looking at the result, um, there are improvement, and the school is very happy because of that. So, you know, because I think the vice principal was really supportive in this particular school, and that's why uh, they wanted to continue in the second cycle. And that's one of the aspects that they wanted to see is the impact on students' learning and impact on students' engagement. Okay. So, so if you can, uh, if you can think about how to assess students after you identify the topic and come up with some tools to be able to, you know, gather evidence on students' learning, that would be. Um, very good. Yeah, I know it's not very easy because it's a different form of learning. But I think, like, you know, coming back to the history of primary, for example, there should be a lot of problems, um, real world problems that, you know, in the textbook, for example, that can easily be extended to include other, con other uh, subjects or disciplines. What do you think? Only mathematics? <laughs> I don't know. Thank you for your presentation, because it's very stimulating. Um, there are a couple of things that, that kept me thinking. One is that you showed uh, one of the examples is a skate park. And uh, Bill Jacob and Kathy Fosno in the uh, context for learning mathematics created a unit for fifth grade students uh, about the skate park, where the mathematics is about uh, changing direction, and so the question is, what is the angle? And uh, they focus on the idea of changing the concept of angle. Because many students make mistakes that if you extend the length of a line on paper, they think the angle is larger. They don't really know what it is. Um, and it's a very beginning concept. And uh, so during your talk, I was thinking about, OK, if that is the starting point, what is the physics I can put in? Or what is uh, maybe even the biology I can put in. And, and combining the two is quite difficult. Um, but uh, your presentation, well, first of all, I was intrigued because you said it's, it's multinational, but all your examples are from Australia. Oh, yeah. And so I would love to hear a little bit more about whether you have the same experiences here in Indonesia, if you can say something about that. Um, and uh, yeah, that's Thank you. That's a very good point. The pro uh, the reason why I didn't include the data from Indonesia is because it like sort of like uh, the teachers from Indonesian project actually did presentations at these conferences. 
And um, Ati Pasan did uh, the first on the first day. He had the presentation as well. So I don't want to repeat or steal the ideas, but I can share some of the uh, the reflections that I had from you know working with the teachers here because we did work with the teachers. We did the professional development with Peter. Uh, so during the pilot time, and then. I was quite impressed actually with the creativity that the teachers had um, because um, what happened in the second cycle especially because they came up with some of the school already have what they call uh, interdisciplinary kind of like approach in their own school but they use it for example in economics home economics context so they're already done like you know getting students to produce something and then sell it think about like you know the, the profit margin and things like that so they build on that one um, and then they extend it to include like I think they're producing um, something Salah from Salah um, what is Salah again? <laughs> uh? Snake fruit, yeah snake fruit, using snake fruits um, to produce papia, like for example, and then to work out um, what is the, I think the compositions and the, the profit again, like, so at the other school is for example coming up with an idea of uh, having or going to an excursion at the zoo and then looking at the different animal classification and coming up with the, a diagram or a set connected to set context or set theory. So there are different, um, in different schools there are variations as well, like you know, in terms of idea and where they are at. One of the challenges I think in Indonesia more so than in Australia is about the expectations to, um, or the pressure of assessment that seems to come up a lot from the teachers here in Indonesia, so they seem to be quite pressured by that. Um, in Australia, it didn't come up so strongly, um, although they talk about VC exams as well, but you know, it's not the very big major constraints for them to participate in the project, but I think for Indonesian schools, often that is the first concern that they have. But um, in Indonesia as well, the teachers, when they've uh, participated in our project, we get them to actually work as a team. So the maths and science teacher, we haven't had like math science and biology or math science, which is a great idea. And thank you for sharing your idea about the skate park. I hope that I can try that later. I think um, for granting the mathematics will make that lesson and will get the students to think more about the mathematics. Uh, more. I think that's that's a very good idea. I'll, if you can send me the link, that would be great. <laughs> okay, thank you. I hope I addressed the questions. Yeah. Do we have more time? Okay, is there yeah. another question? Yes, please. Go. Yeah, one more. Thank you. Um, my name is Zulkarti. I'm from Sri. Um, thank you very much for the very nice presentation. Especially the term Melbourne marble run <laughs> so that's a really very good uh, term marble and marble run well for, for me as a from, from primary uh, side of thinking melbourne uh, marble run is kind of contact right and uh, tool of the context they are doing some activities that come up with the century uh, 21st century learning communication collaboration and critical thinking now, I just want to ask a question, how can we connect, for uh, instance, the activity with the theme of this CDR? This year is about improving the reflective thinking. Yeah. Uh, would you please explain a little bit what you mean by reflective thinking? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, I think from the feedback, or from the, not feedback, but for example, from the uh, interview that we conducted with the teachers and the students, uh, the teachers definitely are very reflective in their comments, like, you know, they're very honest as well, like, you know, the maths teachers is the one who said, like, I think the maths is still, he felt that the maths was still at the background rather than in the foreground, and he would hope that, you know, next time that could be a bit more prominent, so that's a reflection from uh, the teachers uh, and I think the students also reflected about uh, their learning that they are more uh, more independent in their learning thank you um, and I think yes it's probably um, we can do a little bit more maybe but I think in terms of 
collecting evidence of how they can reflect more on their learning. Um, in the report, we didn't do interview with a lot of students, so I think it's only focus group interview with five students, so it's quite a small sample size compared to the whole cohort. But uh, from those who we interviewed, the teacher selected students who you know should participate in the focus group discussion, and the, the reflections are quite good. I mean, they talk about the challenges in terms of group work as well. To actually, you know, uh, some of the challenges uh, like group work um, to solve issues with when things didn't work out, like you know when they they decide to bubble around, it's actually quite challenging. I <laughs> think um, to bend the pipe, I think you know, put the things together. It was not easy, and some groups are very all girls group, not not a mixed mixed group. So I think there are uh, more potential probably for uh, more reflection, but. Definitely, as a researcher, we've been reflecting a lot about, you know, um, from the data, from the experience, and working together. I tried to write together as well with, with the team from Indonesia, so hopefully we can get that uh, published. So we have some uh, publication, uh, one publication coming up from this project um, in a chapter, uh, an inviting chapter by the Taiwanese colleagues, so that will come out this year, I think. But that's from only from the Melbourne data, not from the Indonesia one. Okay, thank you. I think we still have about three minutes, so I would give the opportunity for one more question. Yes, please. I was in schools in the United Kingdom uh, visiting in um, the end of the 80s. Uh, that happens when you're old. Uh, at that time, a lot of schools this, did this kind of experiments, but in my impression, it stays in doing all kinds of things and not in learning. There was no pressure, there was no effort from the teacher to bring it from just doing something to learning. And so I'm very curious what the role of the teacher was to make sure that the children were not just experimenting and trying a new route and trying a new route, but really building in the physics and the mathematics here. So what is what did you ask the teacher to do? What was the, the, the role of the teacher in this experiment? Yeah, so that's a very good point because I think the teachers play a very critical role, like you said. So I think uh, by getting the students or asking questions to students, um, in Australia and Melbourne, usually um, at the start of the lesson, which I don't quite agree that you, but the teachers have the um, have to put the learning intentions at the, on the board, like you, which I don't like as well. I know, uh, but I think. For some teachers, they do that because they think, uh, they think that, well, that's kind of like a, a touch point for the students when they are doing things. They can actually see whether or not they have achieved that learning intention. Like, you know. But I think more so, like when look, I look at the data, I notice that the teachers do ask questions, prompt questions to get the students. Like just now, um, the transcript, I didn't show you the video, but the teachers actually ask the question, so have you actually achieved that, like the expectation? So think about that, and the students have to go back and then come, you know, do more work to actually show the teachers that, you know, their design actually meet the expectation of that. Um, in the other part, because of the uh, approach on representation construction, they have to show the drawing or the representations of the, you know, the design or the the connections. I think there's another slide that has the sort of like the anecdotal notes on. Um, I don't know, where, not there, but the anecdotal notes of, for example, the different concepts. Yeah, this one is quite rough. But like the connection, the connection between gravitational, kinetic, sound, and friction, for instance. So yeah, I think getting the teachers to actually ask whether or not students actually learn about the concept of energy as well as percentages along the way is very important. 
Um, when I look at the video sometimes, I felt like the science teachers probably spent a lot of time talking about something <laughs> at the beginning, but that's just probably, yeah, at the beginning. But, um, but that's not a criticism of the teachers, I think it's just probably the approach, uh, like very relaxed and things like that. Yeah, I, I, uh, I agree with you that it can be a danger as well, like, you know, because in mathematics lesson, even with games, for example, you can get students to be very engaged in playing games, but not necessarily learning something out of that, doing that. So you still have to think about what is the key learning point from doing certain activities. Okay. Thank you. So uh, that is it, ladies and gentlemen, and distinguished uh, guests. Uh, Dr. Wanti's presentation. It reminds me with my own experience when I first learned, uh, when I learned about mathematics. At that time, my teacher gave us, suddenly gave us the Pythagoras formula, and then he gave us some numbers to work with that, but we did not have any idea of what is the relevant of this uh, formula into the real world. And uh, I was wondering now but how the bricklayers or the house builders now are very clever. Even they did not uh, take you know high education or study about Py Py Pythagoras, but they are very good in building houses. And you know, so I think that is the point. The real, uh, the importance of connecting what we learn at school with the real world tasks. So that's what Dr. Wang is uh, trying to. Um, point out here, it is important to engage teachers firsthand with ways to connect the real world tasks by integrating STEM to their understanding of the disciplines. And the second one is that it is very vital to provide opportunities for science and math teachers with the time to plan collaboratively. And it takes quite a long time. Yeah? to map out the curriculum with a, a pedagogical approach that allows individual disciplines to be integrated. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big applause to Dr. Wang. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wang Tiwijaya and Ibu Veronica Triprihatini. To Dr. Hanki Julie, we would like to invite you to come on stage to give a token of appreciation to Dr. Wanti Vijaya and Ibu Veronica Triprihatni. Dr. Hoki Julie, Dr. Wanti Wijaya, and Ibu Veronica Triprihatmin. 